for them. But I would like, now like to take you across to Siddharth Dharavi, who's in conversation with Parag Saxena, the founder and CEO of New Silk Route at the Global Business Forum that's taking place in Goa. Let's go there. the world even if you sort of take the metric of the level of FDI that is allowed but I'm going to come to one of the points that you made about companies and um, because this is this is a, a hall full of innovators uh, this is about technology and innovation uh, globally brand IIT represents innovation and uh, the uh, faces are Indian and we are all proud of it it's a brand that's that resonates across the world uh, the point that you made about um, uh, not enough companies being there, I also want to relate an example for the audience before uh, I come to you, Parag. Um, just last week, uh, we interviewed, Bloomberg TV India interviewed Baba Ramdev uh, for an hour. And uh, I must tell you that it was an amazing discovery. This was not about yoga, this was a business interview. Patanjali Ayurved um, is a company uh, that's grown massively over the last five years. It's on its way to do uh, just a shade lesser than a billion dollars in revenue uh, this uh, financial year and they're talking about going to the market. So for market watchers it's an amazing uh, story and I know that there are several brokerage firms which are putting out reports about that. Um, could you give us examples, Parag, names if possible, of, of shining jewels, unlisted jewels in the Indian uh, 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 corporate space, which to you are examples of innovation and possibly uh, a much larger scale and size going down? I think it's very hard to think about this from a valuation point of view, but a lot of the companies you know, they, in India now, uh, Flipkart, Snapchat, uh, a number of companies that have Snapdeal, I meant, uh, that have huge valuations. And th the key part in technology I worry about is to enable that technology, we need to have infrastructure. You know, so just as ports were the infrastructure for trade years ago and the railways are now, we need to get into providing the telecom infrastructure. Otherwise, you know, we, we, we see this pro proposition from Tri of, you know, one rupee per dropped call. Can you imagine what's going to happen when demand for uh, volume gets up 20, 30,000 fold? Because that is what is going to happen with data. It is not a simple increase of 20% per year. Right. It's tens of thousands in time. So I think the infrastructure needs to be laid out. But, you know, the names, there are lots of names that are on paper, have very high values. You know, they need to grow into those values, meaning that revenues have to follow profit. I, I was about to, to ask you whether those valuations, and without reference to any specific company, because right. it may not be fair to discuss them while they are not here and they don't have an opportunity right. to answer, uh, but generally e-commerce valuations in India, everybody agrees, seem to be far ahead of sustainability. And the worry that a whole lot of people have, and uh, uh, because it's a space which is not large uh, regulated and therefore free to do business in the manner they want, is about they causing a crash and a sentimental impact and hit as far as the green shoots of the recovery that we see uh, which are on their way to sort of become more uh, solid in the Indian economy. I think that prices will definitely fluctuate. I also think that internet related businesses globally are overpriced and I think that's true in the US and I could be wrong you know I, I, I've been saying that for two years and in those two years those valuations have grown significantly uh, but I think in India we have the incremental problem of whether the infrastructure will catch up with the valuations. Okay on the infrastructure I'm going to ask you about the relevance of GST uh, but before I do that let me also inform the audience about the development just a few hours uh, earlier today uh, a large brick and mortar company uh, the uh, the Aditya Birla group, which also had exposure to standard retail, has announced a dot-com uh, foray, uh, which intends to compete with uh, many of the names that Parag was uh, referring to. So perhaps a reflection of the fact that e-commerce, as far as consumers uh, is concerned, um, there is a personal bet that the founders of that company uh, ha have uh, uh, made and we don't know what will happen. But let's, let's come to uh, uh, one more part, really the final part of our uh, conversation uh, today. Uh, as far as sentiment is concerned, uh, with regard to 
to the Indian economy and the policy direction, uh, several people have said, oh, without GST, you know, things are not going to happen. But the other side of the coin also says that you have a fairly okay uh, uh, VAT structure in place and GST is work in progress. Uh, you have to understand the way uh, the federal uh, nature of our politics is concerned and therefore this slight sense of impatience that some foreign investors express about India is that is that a valid parag or would you advise them to sort of or do you advise them to take a deep breath and take a much more longer uh, perspective as far as india is concerned i think i'd say you know take a deep breath and you know give some time uh, if you think about development in india 1991 is widely agreed to be the point in time at which the first meaningful economic reforms took place but the payoff from that higher rates of GDP, rates above 5%, did not come till 2004, yep. right? So it took a long time for that to happen. Now, I think things happen at a faster pace. And as I said, it's, you know, it's a question of whether we can sync the vision, you know, at, at the ministerial level with the bureaucracy that has to put that into effect. And we need to sync those. If we can sync those, we can actually go, I think, faster than we are. But certainly all the promises made, April 16 for GST, if, if those kinds of deadlines are met, together with things that have happened like MAT, you know, that, that's good stuff. You know, it's, it's um, on the way. And, and the tax bit is largely now behind us. It's all in the implementation. You know, there, there are three crucial points here. Implementation, implementation, and implementation. Okay, implementation, and that's, that's the key word. Before I let you go, Parag, I'm, I'm very tempted to ask you about how the Cafe Coffee Day IPO, uh, when I last checked a few hours back, it had been subscribed one time. Do you have an update uh, for us here? Uh, my best guess is that it's going to be better than two times subscribed overall. Okay. Right. Okay. And, and, and the reason I really brought that up uh, for the audience is that that also tells you uh, a remarkable story about how India's consumption is shaping up. Imagine 10 years back, 15 years back, about a coffee company with a name which says Cafe Coffee Day. Of course, it does a few other products also, uh, uh, enjoying the kind of market support that it witnessed today. Uh, Parag Saxena, always a pleasure having you uh, here. Thank you very much for your time and your views here today. Thank you so much. A lot can happen over a cup of coffee. A lot can happen over a cup of coffee. Thank you so much. the conversation that we do reaches out not just to the people who are watching this live uh, on Bloomberg TV India but to the audience which really comprises some of the finest minds uh, from India. So the first question and I'm going to start uh, where I had also started with Parag is the 13 to 14 percent uh, GDP growth number that he uh, sort of threw at us. Is that possible uh, Mr. Sinha and if so by when and what would be required to do that? Well, thank you, Siddharth, and thank you all of uh, you for having me here. You realize, of course, that it is quite heretical for me to be here with this IIT Bombay audience since I'm from IIT Delhi. But when Manoharji asked me to come, I really couldn't say no. And of course, I know I have a few friends in the audience that have been through IIT Delhi as well. Uh, and which is why I said, uh, at least I'll have some friends like Professor Kakar, who's also from IIT Delhi here. So very glad to be here with you all. I think it's a fantastic event, uh, as Parag was also saying, and uh, very happy to uh, share some thoughts with you all uh, about what's happening uh, in the Indian economy. So let me answer your question, Siddharth, about uh, what is a reasonable uh, projection with respect to our long-term real GDP growth rate. 
Uh, Parag laid out, I think, uh, what is a, a very uh, inspiring, if you will, target for us. Of course, he, like all IITNs do, laid it out very well analytically, median GDP growth rate by so, such and such time, and imputing from that what we would call in IIT Delhi a Laplace transform, he figures out that it is 13 to 14 percent that he needs to do. But nonetheless, uh, while it would be, it would be great uh, to reach such a number, the reality is that most economies, and certainly our economy as well, as we know uh, from our own economic history, uh, have a natural speed limit. Uh, and as best as we can tell from, uh, from the data, uh, the long-term speed limit for the Indian economy, given our demographics, given our GDP per capita where we are right now, is somewhere between 8 to 10 percent. I think that's uh, given the investment rate, uh, given uh, the speed at which we can get things done, uh, if we can get to an 8 to 10 percent GDP growth rate, that would be fantastic. Now, rather than spending too much time worrying about whether it's 8 percent, 9 percent, 10 percent, or even higher, what we really have to think about is how long we can sustain that. And here, China's example uh, is, is extraordinarily important for us. Because China has actually been able to uh, sustain GDP growth rate of over 9% for over 30 years. And if there's a miracle in China in terms of uh, eliminating poverty and really making it uh, uh, the very sort of uh, developed nation it is today, it's because they've been able to sustain it over a long period of time. Now the challenge for us in India, Siddharth, is that we've had periods when we've grown 8, 9, nine and a half percent, but we've not been able to sustain it in the long term. We've had a boom-bust type of pattern. And so what we are trying to do, uh, and my colleagues here, you know, uh, the Honorable Environmental Minister and the Honorable Defense Minister are here as well, uh, and what uh, philosophy all of us share is that we want to build India's productive capacity. And so our approach is much more supply side oriented, much more investment driven than the previous government. Because we recognize that unless we build India's productive capacity, the hard assets and the soft assets, we can't sustain the growth over a period of time. We'll hit supply side bottlenecks, which we've done repeatedly in our, uh, uh, in our history. And then, you know, we'll go into uh, a bus cycle and then you'll come down to 4%, 5%, which by the way had happened uh, previously. And then it becomes very difficult given the inertia in the economy the over-levered balance sheets, the legacy issues you have to deal with, all of which we're dealing with right now, to once again bring growth up to 8%. So really our economic strategy is to build India's productive capacity. The hard assets are obviously the roads, the bridges, the highways, the factories, all of that. The soft assets, which I think you'll, you'll appreciate, the soft assets are building India's skills, employability of our people, building our institutions so that they can provide the appropriate regulation, the appropriate checks and balances that we need so that uh, we can really achieve sustainable growth, and our innovation ecosystem, which is part of our soft assets. So if we can put in place the hard and the soft assets, then we can really increase our productive capacity and we can sustain the growth rate. And it's the duration of that high growth rate, I think, that's more important than worrying whether it is 8%, 9%, or 10%. The duration of the uh, growth rate is uh, very important. And you touched upon two uh, important points there. One was uh, the leverage on balance sheets. Uh, I'm going to come to that. But before I do that, I quickly uh, wanted to get your sense, because you've some, been someone who spent a lot of time in the private world. Uh, you lived overseas. Now you are in, in the government of India, Bharat Sarkar. And Bharat Sarkar um, is, a, is a huge um, sort of uh, creature, if I may uh, use that word. Um, not, not in terms of the personal transition that you had to make, but in terms of some of the voices that you uh, hear sometimes, uh, and that is the impatient with the speed of governance, the speed of government. Uh, what would you say to uh, 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 such people about how it really works from the inside? So when it comes to government, I always explain to people that I have an outsider's perspective, but also an insider's perspective. Let me explain. I have absolutely an outsider's perspective. My 30-year professional career has been in the private sector, not in the public sector. Of those 30 years, I spent 22 years in America. And unlike the economists, 
and the public policy experts that opine on public policy. Like Manoharji, I'm an engineer, and like all of you, I'm an engineer. So we are really outsiders in that sense. But I'm also an insider. And I'm an insider because I'm the son of an IAS officer and a politician. And so I've had an opportunity to grow up in that milieu and see what the bureaucracy is like and what politics is like. Uh, and that brings me to why is it that getting government to do more quicker is so difficult. And it's really because of three reasons. Uh, I think one is that uh, while we would like the government to be, and in some states, I think in Goa under Manohar leadership, it really was that type of, uh, of a government, a government that is focused on serving the people uh, in a very dedicated and inspiring way. That functional government, sadly, in many parts of India, we have instead of a functional government like that, like the Goa government, we have a dysfunctional government where there is a lot of rent seeking going on. So we have, our state is not what it should be. I wish we could all have a government as good as Goa's, but we don't. In many states, uh, we have a, a, a government that is not, not very functional, it's much more dysfunctional. That's one problem. The second problem that all of us have coming from the private sector is that we have a very much an execution mindset. So we sit down and we say, okay, just like Parag was saying, here are our targets, 13, 14%. Okay, if that's our target, analytically, what do we need to do? What are our milestones? How do we achieve those milestones? What resources, what people do we need to have to achieve those milestones? Now, with those milestones, let's go off and execute, let's monitor, let's see where the bottlenecks are, and let's make it happen. That is the private sector practical, pragmatic mindset towards getting things done. That's not government's mindset sometimes. Government's mindset is, I have today in my, on my desk five files or ten files, I do the files and I go home. So that execution mindset is not there, it's much more of a file processing, more of a routine type of mindset, which is a second challenge that we have. The third challenge, frankly, is because of us. And when I say us, I mean the political leadership, which is if the political leadership has to take hold of this dysfunctional state, if it is going to motivate and inspire the official machinery to get things done, uh, then we really need very, very capable administrators, people who understand things at a granular level and can drive execution. Now, we are very fortunate in our government with the Honorable Prime Minister to have one such individual who is not just a gifted politician and an extraordinary political figure, but somebody who is a brilliant, brilliant administrator as well. Uh, and so we are all inspired by the example. I think you know my colleagues here uh, have a well-deserved reputation, Prakashji and Manoharji, for also being very, very able administrators. But we have too few of them. So in our political leadership, we need really able administrators that are able to understand what the limitations of the state are, how you manage people, how you set targets, and how you get things done. We don't have enough such people. And that makes it all the more difficult to get, as Parag correctly said, the three most important things about how to take India forward, implementation, implementation, and implementation. He's exactly right. Absolutely. And um, uh, since we're talking about implementation, now let me talk about a couple of the larger issues that uh, you and the entire government is uh, addressing and for the benefit of the audience here. One is the banking sector. Uh, several steps have been taken. I, I want you to uh, recap, if you uh, can, uh, what are the fundamental changes and policy options that you have exercised as far as the banking sector is concerned? Because one of the overall uh, uh, barriers for growth, sustainable growth, as you pointed out, is our banking sector and whether it is the poorest of the uh, poor or the richest person in India, it is all about banking and I, I think that is something that you yourself have been involved. So I want you to sort of give us a recap on that. So Siddharth, you want me to recap the recapitalization? <laughs> Uh, well, obviously, you know, one of the major legacy issues uh, that we had to deal with when uh, our government came in uh, was the state of our uh, public sector banks. I will distinguish between our public sector banks, which, of which we have 22, uh, depending on how you count the State Bank of India uh, affiliates, 
uh, as well as our other important public sector financial institutions, LIC and uh, the insurance companies and so on. I will distinguish between those as well as our very, very competitive, world-class private sector financial institutions whom you know well, ICICI, HDFC uh, and others that are actually flourishing and doing extraordinarily well. And in fact, uh, for those of you who follow the markets, you'll know that HDFC Bank has uh, the highest uh, price to book multiple among all major banks in the world. That's how well regarded HDFC Bank is. Uh, so our overall financial sector is doing quite well. But uh, when, we, when we came in, we found that our public sector banks were actually uh, you know, uh, facing a lot of very important challenges. I won't get into why those challenges arose. Many of you have read the stories. You recognize uh, what was happening, uh, the dysfunctional behavior uh, that led to them. Uh, but what we have done about it uh, to deal with our public sector banks, we believe, and I think uh, I can say with a fair amount of, uh, uh, of sincerity, uh, that what we've done for our public sector banks is perhaps the most sweeping set of changes since they were nationalized in 1969. And there's really five important aspects to uh, what we've done. First and foremost, we fixed the governance of the banks. Uh, previously, the way people were appointed as directors in the banks, the way CMDs were selected was, we would say, uh, a system that was not working very well. And so when we came in, we immediately sat uh, down to fix that. And now we have a much more open, transparent, meritocratic process, which is reflected in the people we are selecting for the boards as well as the CMDs of the banks. So governance was number one. Number two was we said... I wanted to interrupt you and uh, remind the audience about the fact that just yesterday, uh, uh, that process has yielded a result where a private sector executive has taken over a public sector bank and that is, uh, I mean, at least I, I, I can't recall of a similar example in the last two decades and I think that's the point that Mr. Sinha is uh, making. Please that's right. Ahead. So yeah. Mr. Jayakumar has just taken over. Mr. P. Jayakumar is uh, the managing director of the Bank of Baroda which after State Bank of India is our second largest bank uh, and the chairman of the Bank of Baroda uh, is and I'm sure I'll get a round of applause for this is Ravi Venkateshan, your very own Ravi Venkateshan from IIT Bombay. 